Hello there, and welcome to SLU, your interface to outer space. I'm your host, Jerry Monteux, and konnichiwa to you all, as we are thrilled to wish you a very happy Tanabata, the Japanese Star Festival. Tonight, we'll be traveling across the Milky Way as we follow the story of two starry-eyed lovers, separated by a river of stars on their once-a-year journey to reunite in the sky. Now, these two lovers are represented by the stars Vega and Altair, and we'll be tracking their trek across the Milky Way and stopping off to see some of the most beautiful objects you can imagine using our live telescopic feeds. And here to tell us about the amazing live views that we have lined up for you tonight is our friend, SLU astronomer Paul Cox. Paul, welcome aboard. Happy Tanabata, my friend. And the same to you, Jerry. Good to be here. All right, what do you have for us tonight, feed-wise? We have got just about every SLU telescope pointing upwards tonight. Uh, well, you can see that uh, we've got this pesky full moon here, and we saw this rising in the Pico del Tedi cam a little bit earlier. Uh, so here, here we can see, Jerry, we're looking down 2,000 feet down onto the observatory, which is above the clouds. There we can see the shadow of the actual volcano, and then above it in the sky, that's the very nearly full moon rising. So we are contending with that, but what this shows us is conditions are great tonight. So if we also look at the observatory panorama and our slew all sky cameras, we can see the kind of conditions. That looks like it's daylight, but it's not. It's the moon uh, just illuminating the sea and all of the other telescopes there. Here you can see our special low light camera. Now, normally on a summer night like tonight, we'd actually see the Milky Way as a kind of cloudy um, pathway going across this image, but the moonlight totally drowns that out. We will see it later when the moon sets, but we've also got our constellation cam, and our constellation cam is actually looking at uh, Vega. So down in the, uh, I think it's the, the top right, actually, uh, the, 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 the bright star Vega, in the constellation of Lyra. Um, and that's actually the Milky Way. You can just see it, actually. There's a, there's a kind of little milky, you know, cloudy patch going through the middle of that image. Um, so we might catch that a, a little bit better later on as well. But we also have SLU's mighty telescopes. We've got the Canary uh, One Half Meter Telescope. Now, these are all the telescopes that SLU members control every night. And there we can see, wow. I don't know wow. if that one is Vega or Altair. That probably looks like Vega to me. Um, and we are tracking these wonderful objects as we go, as we follow uh, their pathway across the star. But this is Vega. We're also seeing Altair in the Canary 2 telescope. Uh, actually, no, this one, uh, Canary 1, the half meter, there you go, um, mm -hmm. is, that one is uh, Vega, sorry. And uh, Canary 1 is going to be Altair. So those are the two stars of our show. But we've also got these magical um, objects that we're going to be looking at. And it's really going to showcase what the SLU telescopes can do. Now, some of the images might look, when they go into color, might kind of take on a bit of a green hue. That's mm -hmm. because of the moonlight, right? But um, we should have some really wonderful, wonderful views tonight. OK, so we're talking about, in addition to stars, and we've already seen the moon, we're talking about nebulae, among other things. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, we we picked a, a few good ones, and and one of the one of the most beautiful actually, and I think quite appropriate for this kind of story of star-crossed lovers is the Ring Nebula. Uh, so we got two planetary nebulas. These are uh, star sun-like stars that have kind of blown off their outer atmosphere. So we got the Ring Nebula. We got the Dumbbell Nebula. The, the Dumbbell <laughs> Nebula is going to look beautiful tonight. It really is, and and it will be so easy to to see why it's called the dumbbell but we've also got uh, star clusters we've got globular star clusters which are these tightly packed cities of stars and then we've got open star clusters and eric edelman he's going to be coming on the show a little bit later and tell us a bit more about each one of these objects but you know nearing the end of their journey we're also going to be seeing some vast supernova remnants so these are supermassive stars when they end their lives 
they blow up in a massive cosmic explosion called a supernova and we're going to see the Veil Nebula. And once again, I thought that was quite appropriate for this kind of lover's story that we're telling tonight. And, and they just look absolutely stunning. The, the, the tenuous streams of gas that we're going to see, you know, uh, gas and dust going across the images will be pretty nice. But we are also going to end their journey at what I think is one of the most beautiful objects in the night sky, if you've got a pair of binoculars, and that's the double star Albireo. Um, and it's, it's the color contrast. We're gonna see it in the images right at the end of the show. And the color contrast is just absolutely astounding. One's gold, one's blue, and they just look absolutely delightful together. Well, it's a show and quite a show. Uh, on this show tonight. Hey, hey, by the way, welcome to all of you out there watching tonight on Facebook, and we're going to encourage all of you to surf on over and watch us on slew.com. And Paul, for a couple of very good reasons, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one, you've got the rest of the SLU website there. So we've got these wonderful, this huge quantity of uh, posts by members in our community content areas, which, which go into, you know, a lot of the areas that we talk about. It's not just about science here at SLU. It's art and culture. We've got human spirit as well. Uh, Helen's going to be joining us later to talk about that aspect of it. But also to watch the show, watch any of SLU's shows, actually, uh, at SLU.com, you can switch between all of these individual feeds that people can see in the main video now. And you can also snap your own pictures from each of those feeds. So that's a really cool feature that you can get. But of course, people on Facebook, they can ask us uh, questions and people can tweet us as well uh, to at SLU and we can answer any questions during the show. So. Very user friendly. All right, uh, thanks a bunch, Paul. Uh, we look forward to talking to you again very soon in the show. Uh, I'll be talking about how members can choose the best telescope to use for any particular object. So we'll check back with you shortly. Up next, we'll be joined by SLU astronomer Eric Edelman, who will take us the story of the two lovers and the legend of Tanabata itself. He'll also start our mapping journey across the stars, which Paul alluded to, and discuss what we're looking at along the way. Later, Helen Avery joins us, SLU's Human Spirit editor, to discuss how this festival is celebrated today, what customs and fun are had and just who celebrates. So please stick around. We'll be right back after this. Give the gift of the universe. Give the gift of SLU, a celebration of every magical moment in the night sky. For just $60, you can give the budding space explorer in your life the gift of a full year of SLU membership. It's available now at slu.com. And we welcome you back to SLU, your interface to outer space. Tonight, we celebrate the Japanese star festival known as Tanabata by looking up at the stars, Vega and Altair. But that's just the beginning because we're getting a glimpse not only at the Milky Way, but into the Milky Way. And here to discuss the importance of these views to the legend of Tanabata is SLU astronomer Eric Edelman. Eric also happens to be our go-to guy when it comes to Tanabata. So, Eric, welcome. Who are the two lovers? Uh, what do these stars in the Milky Way have to do with this story? Yeah, what's up with this day, Tanabata? Yeah. Well, do I have a story for you? Uh, so, these two lovers are Orihime and Hikoboshi. So, one by one, first off, we have Orihime, and that's the weaving princess. And it literally, her name translates in English to the weaving princess, Ori being weaving, Hime being princess. Now, Hime, what, what sort of princess is she? Well, it turns out she's a pretty big deal, that her father is Tente, the emperor of the heavens, of, of all that's around. And so Ten being heavenly, Te being emperor. So we're very literally translating these things. So Tente, what he was all about is he loved, you know, watching his daughter do her work because she was amazing at her weaving. Uh, she would weave these beautiful uh, works of art on the edge of the Amanogawa, or uh, in English, the river of the Milky Way. 
Mm -hmm. And her work was just incredibly, incredibly gorgeous. But there was something missing. Orihime wasn't happy. She was lonely. She only was doing her work, so she really didn't have time to sort of fill the hole that was in her heart. And her father noticed this, and he wanted to help out, so he set her up with a cow herder on the other side of the Amanoga Amanogawa, the other side of the river, Kikoboshi, uh, and they ended up being an absolutely perfect match. So the hev Heavenly Emperor was apparently just really, really good at his job, whether it was guiding over the heavens or matchmaking. But I think he was a little bit too good at his job at this time because Orihime and Hikoboshi were so enamored with each other, so in love with each other, that they ended up not really doing their other jobs. They were too focused on each other. Uh, Orihime stopped weaving as much, and Hikoboshi, he just sort of let his cows wander across the Milky Way. It was a whole big mess. So uh, Tente saw all this and really wasn't happy with the result of all this and he went to those two lovebirds and he told them that it was over. Uh, they could no longer be with each other. And so Orihime would have to stay on her side of the Milky Way and Hikoboshi would have to stay on his. There's a little bit more to this story, but I just want to point out that for the live images, we're actually starting our journey here today with Altair being the starting place, that being Hikoboshi personified, and then Vega being Orihime personified as well. So there's there's the two maps, there's the two points of our journey. You can see that dusty mm -hmm. line across the screen sort of going diagonal uh, there from top to bottom is that that is the Milky Way. And then we have uh, Vega uh, right on the top there, that is Orihime, and then Altair below, that's Hikoboshi. And on this special day, a spoiler alert for the story, by the way, they're gonna be traveling toward each other. So with the telescopes, what we're doing is we're hopping one by one from different objects that are across um, the Milky Way so that they will eventually, uh, those telescopes meet uh, at one specific, very special place in the sky. And we've gotten actually to one of those first deep sky objects. So we'll get to those very soon, I promise. But I'm almost done with this story here. So what was happening? Yes, they were on different sides of the river. They couldn't see each other. They were all very sad. Orihime was so sad that she went to her father and was like, was there anything we can do about this? I am really upset. I really want to see Hikoboshi. And so Tente had a soft spot for his daughter. And he said, OK, yeah, we'll, we'll try and fix this on a couple conditions. So the main condition being that she had to stop slacking off. She had to do her work really well. So if she worked really hard, hard all year, on the seventh day of the seventh month, these two lovers could meet, uh, journey across the river, and find each other for this one special night, being Tanabata. And so it goes. Uh, so yes, the seventh day, seventh month, you, you can cross the bridge, or Orihime and Hikoboshi cross the bridge of the Milky Way as long as there are clear skies. Uh, they get this one meeting from a year's worth of very hard work. And so that is a big summary of the story. There's there's a lot in there, but I think that's a good place to start. Uh, okay, you said as long <laughs> as there are clear skies, what happens when it's cloudy? What happens when it rains? And so this is an interesting part of the story, at least from my perspective. So uh, if it rains, uh, so, so what happens is when it's clear skies, a bridge of magpies uh, appears, and they're able to cross with the help of the magpies to meet each other um, via this Milky Way bridge. But if it rains, the magpies won't show up. Now, that means that they can't meet each other. So this is interesting to me because what, what this story is based on is the journey of stars across the Milky Way. And that's really outside the sphere of our planet's environment. We don't, uh, the, the rain doesn't fall up to the stars, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's, I think it's a good example of how this story is so placed in astronomy alongside the culture of the time and the, the experiences people had of the time so that what we what we live through is what we see the stars going through in a way well Tanabata seems to have a lot to do with wishing and and, and hoping I, I, do you have any idea where all this uh, wishing upon a star stuff wishing upon the universe actually began any idea it, there's a lot of there's a lot of yeah wishing on this particular um uh, festival day. It, it's something that actually uh, uh, people will, uh, they'll write wishes, um, tanzaku, that they'll put on, on, on bamboo sticks. And it's sort of a way for people to go alongside the wish that Orihime and Hikoboshi had to see each other. If other people had wishes, perhaps romantic wishes, this is the day to try and see that they're fulfilled sort of deal. And so wishing upon a star, it's uh, a big part of this uh, particular festival. And it's also 
I think something that we see a lot around the world, uh, shoot, uh, wishing on a shooting star. It's, mm -hmm. it's a phrase that I think is pretty common in English. And uh, I'm not sure exactly where it came from. I'm not sure if we do know, but there are a lot of, you know, famous quotes from way back in the day, like Ptolemy, the Greek philosopher, he said that shooting stars were happening because the gods were opening up holes in the sky to look down on humans. And so for, for me, I take this sort of sentiment to be that we human beings, we see something exceptional, uh, something wonderful, something beautiful, like a meteor streaking across the sky, and it becomes a sort of aspiration, a connection to something bigger than us. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to relate to the the gigantic beauty that surrounds us uh, to try and digest how incredible that is and in some ways maybe feel like we can one day be that incredible too uh, so it's I think it's a bit you know the possibility of what lies beyond sure sure well we, we do know it goes a, a long way back in uh, in in Japan and, and and it originally came from the Chinese but let, let's talk about what you've been up to uh, and that is mapping mapping the lover's journey across the Milky Way. So the first stop was obviously uh, Vega and Altair. We've seen them. And now we're looking at uh, a ring over oh, back to the uh, back to the stars. We saw the ring nebula. Eric. Yeah, that's uh, the first stop. So Hikoboshi, the, the one on the bottom there, it has now traveled a little ways up the Milky Way. And so now we're at this uh, globular cluster, or, or no, sorry, this is uh, what Orihime from the top is looking at. Uh, this is the Ring Nebula, uh, and so this is from the uh, Canary Islands 2 telescope, and it, so it's a little bit going down to the Milky Way, the constant All right, we're having uh, difficulties with Eric's signal. We're going to try and get him back uh, momentarily. But right now, we're looking at the uh, Ring Nebula. And uh, earlier, we saw shots of uh, Vega and Altair representing Orihime and Hikoboshi standing out uh, incredibly brilliantly uh, in, the, in the night sky. And... That's something that we're going to ask Eric about when he comes back. Why is it that they stand out so brilliantly? But right now, courtesy of our Canary 2 telescope from the Canary Islands, we're looking at the Ring Nebula. As we take our journey across the Milky Way, several stops along the way. A planetary nebula. Could it ever have anything to do with our own solar system? That's another question we're going to ask. We're going to take a break right now, and when we come back, we'll chat with Helen Avery. So don't go away. We've been all over the world chasing solar eclipses to share with you. This time, you're coming with us. Join SLU as we expedition to Stanley, Idaho to celebrate the transcontinental eclipse on August 21st. Sign up today at slu.com. Space is limited. And we welcome you back to SLU as we celebrate Tanabata. This festival traditionally comes from Japan via China. So many of our viewers may not know how it's celebrated or what customs are practiced for the festival. And luckily, we're joined tonight by Helen Avery, SLU's Human Spirit Editor, to give us some information on how this event is observed. Helen, Helen, Hello. Helen, <laughs> happy Tanabata. Happy Tanabata to you. Is tonight 
actually the proper night to celebrate Tanabata? Oh, not really. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to argue with millions of Japanese people. So, um, well, so Tanabata means Eve of the Seventh. And as Eric, Eric mentioned, it's, it's this the seventh night of the seventh month that these two lovers are allowed to meet. Now, of course, we're using the Gregorian calendar to make it today, and uh, a lot of Japanese people will celebrate it today. Um, but if, in actual fact, it would be uh, July the 29th, um, I believe, because that's uh, the new moon is on the 23rd, and that's counted as day one of a lunar month. So when this, you know, this legend that came from China originally uh, it would have been a lunar calendar so for that reason um, actually there's a couple of provinces in Japan that celebrate on the 7th of August because they want to keep to this 7th evening but actually the 7th of August is nearer the the true date so that would be Sendai uh, is the, the the region and they have a very very famous festival well it sounds to me Helen like if you're in Japan, you have your choice of when you can celebrate Tanabata. That sounds great to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the 7th of July or the 7th of August, you're, you're good either way. You'll catch it either way. Um, and I know you and I have spoken about this in the week. Like, what is the, the relevance of the number seven? Mm -hmm. um, and so if you remember, this actually sort of was adopted from a story from China and then um, adopted by the Japanese. Um, and seven for the Chinese represents togetherness. It's a very lucky number for relationships. So that sort of makes sense of why it would be on the 7th of the 7th. So yeah, Helen, you what, 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 sorry, go on. I was just going to ask you about the customs that are observed uh, in, in Japan. And, and what does a Tanabata festival look like? Ooh, what doesn't it look like? Yeah, I mean, it's fantastic. It's, uh, so it's a huge celebration all day. And in fact, in Sendai, it lasts like three days. Um, so here you can see, you know, with uh, the... The shopping streets are decorated. Um, uh, the homes are decorated. Outside the homes are decorated. There are festivals with parades. Um, there's lots of sort of traditional foods. One of the traditional Tanabata foods is like noodles, sort of representing the weaving, the threads. Um, uh, and then sometimes for children, you'll cut up bits of okra that look like stars and then throw them in these noodles. So you could eat those at a Tanabata festival. Um, there's music and there's a Tanabata song that's often sung and there's fireworks at night. Um, and then, uh, and, and Eric talked a little about this. One of the, the most beautiful things is, I think, um, that people write uh, wishes um, or uh, like poems, but, but wishes in the forms of poems. Um, here we have some. Um, and um, they're written and they're called Tanzaku. It's like, right? <laughs> and people hang them on bamboo um, branches uh, so sometimes outside the home sometimes through the village um, and people come and they write them and they hang them up and then the next day the bamboo sticks are all gathered and um and either burned or they, they used to be put in the river or to the water but now we're all environmentally friendly and that doesn't happen so sometimes they're burned um so it's just a, it's such a beautiful beautiful festival that sort of celebrates love but also this sort of occasion for getting out and looking at the stars and reminding ourselves you know where it all began. It's very, very cool stuff. Uh, uh, Helen, uh, I was wondering this myself. Is there anything that, that I or a, any of our SLU members or people watching tonight can do from home to have their own little mini uh, Tanabata celebration or, or a major Tanabata celebration if they want? <laughs> Woo, absolutely. Um, I, you know, what, for one, you could celebrate on the actual day. You could be really true to form and uh, come on the on the 29th of July, have your Tanabata party and maybe, you know, book some slew telescopes so you can see um, Vega and Altair coming together and have your friends around for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, again, you could order in a ton of Japanese food. That's never bad. A few Sapporos, uh, maybe some sake. And uh, write your own <laughs> hopes and wishes on bits of paper and hang them around your garden and next day put stumble outside and bring them down and burn them all. And, and you know, if given the normal date, like if you say the true date of Tanabata, uh, it's a crescent moon. Um, and actually, in addition to this sort of legend of the magpie's wings forming a bridge over the Milky Way for the two lovers to meet, some people said that crescent moon was like a boat that took them to each other across. But of course, tonight... 
um, if, if we're thinking about the 7th of July as being the date, we were actually near a full moon. Um, so you could almost just roll in your full moon ritual if you wanted to celebrate tonight, which is a similar thing, write your hopes and dreams on a bit of paper and put them outside. So that would be my suggestion, a few Sapporos, uh, some good Japanese food, have your friends around to look up at the sky and, and get all mushy and romantic. <laughs> You know, I, I, I think I can handle this. It's, 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 <laughs> it's food, beer, sake, and a few wishes with your, with your friends. I got it covered. I got it covered. I can. <laughs> All right, Helen, thanks a million. And thanks so much for joining us tonight. Good stuff. Happy okay. Tanabata. And to you, Jerry. All right, Bye. next up. <laughs> All right, next up, we will turn back to uh, the Milky Way and the journey of the star-crossed lovers. So don't go away. You're watching SLU.com. We're excited to announce the release of our first book, The Saturn Above It, an anthology of short fiction about space. Available now at slew.com. And welcome back. It's slew.com and it is Tanabata. We are celebrating. We are looking now live through our Canary Islands telescopes, the observatory of Panorama. And we welcome back to the show. We've gotten our, uh, our issues worked out with Eric Edelman and he returns to us now. Eric, Eric, how are Hi you? Hi there. <laughs> okay, we, we, we are back. And when we left you, we were talking about the Ring Nebula, I do believe. Yes, indeed. That was one of the very first objects that sort of was going to start the journey. Orihime made her way uh, to the Ring Nebula, and I think it's a beautiful, beautiful start to things. Planetary nebulae, they have these gorgeous colors associated with them. And it was this, you know, wonderful circular object that we see in the sky. And so we see these two bright stars, that's where we started, but then this planetary nebula, this is what happens when some star stars get really old, when some stars die. And so we see this incredible puffed out cloud of gas and dust that can uh, be you know, hundreds, thousands of times larger than the original star that they came from, and the, just this gorgeous array of colors. And so that's, that's where we were starting initially here. And then we've actually moved on to the second uh, object on Orihime's journey. I believe we're currently looking at globular cluster M56. And so we're talking about one star, but then there are some deep sky objects that are just these bundles, these baskets, these gorgeous conglomerations of stars, as it were. Uh, this is something that's over, it's around 84 light years across, so it's gigantic. But it might look a little small because it's really, really far away from us. It's 32,900 light years away. And so to give you a conception of just how far away that that is, uh, so the distance from the Earth to the sun is about 93 million miles. And that's something it takes light about eight and a half minutes to travel. But to get from our planetary system to this globular cluster, light would need about 33,000 years, mm. which is so much of a huge distance. It's sort of mind-boggling to consider just how big our universe is. This is, And this is just, we're just looking at stuff in our very own galaxy. There's extra galactic stuff as well. And uh, another thing about this globular cluster is I think it's right about the uh, same age as the universe, give or take a... a, a uh, few hundred million years or so. So no big deal. It's just a little bit old. And it also has the mass of about 230,000 suns. So as Orihime is taking this journey, seeing what's out there in the cosmos as she makes her way toward Hikoboshi, she gets to see some of these so incredible larger than life objects, uh, just like we consider these, you know, Vega and Altair a little larger than life. So we put some humanity in them as well. 
Yeah, it's it's cool to think that these uh, th this globular cluster in particular is just in our neighborhood, you know. Now, is it true, Eric, that that scientists actually think it's possible that this globular cluster may not have always belonged in the Milky Way? Yes, yes, it's very very true. Uh, so there's this uh, there's this phrase that I think. Uh, uh, is I think sparks a lot of people's imagination uh, that scientists will say galactic cannibalism. Uh, it's, it's fun uh, because it's exactly what it sounds like. There are it's a dog eat dog or galaxy eat galaxy world out there, and the bigger <laughs> galaxies they can consume the smaller galaxies. And luckily for us, we're one of the bigger galaxies, so we're part of what's known as the local group of galaxies. So this includes galaxies that are sort of just hanging out nearby to each other, and there's upwards of about 54 galaxies there. We're one of the we're one of the big three. Uh, there, so us, the Milky Way. There's also Andromeda, and there's also the Triangulum Galaxy. But then around us, there are these smaller, what we call dwarf galaxies. And so. Just to give you an example of how they vary in size, the Milky Way is something, it's a little over 100,000 light years across. So no big deal, that's, that's fine. And then we, uh, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you might have had the experience of seeing the Magellanic Clouds uh, with the naked eye. Uh, like the Large Magellanic Cloud, for example, is about 14,000 light years across. And so I did the math and uh, comparing the Large Magellanic Cloud to the Milky Way is like comparing Shaq to an average adult humpback whale. Uh, so there's a really there's a big difference uh, between the two. Uh, and so what was happening or what scientists uh, think might have happened by studying the stars in this particular cluster is that there was a dwarf galaxy a long time ago that got a little too close to the Milky Way and the Milky Way consumed it. It ate it. And so now the stars that were part of that dwarf galaxy are part of what has made the Milky Way even bigger. So some of these galaxies, they just accrete material from other poor, smaller things around them and become these big, gigantic things. And so, yes, galactic cannibalism, it may have made the globular cluster M56 part of our hometown. Interesting. Uh, I wonder if we could get a shot again of Vega and Altair. Uh, earlier in the program, Eric, we saw some tremendous close-ups of both of them, and they were just absolutely, absolutely brilliant, uh, breathtakingly bright. Is, is that unusual? Uh, so the, the brightness, it's interesting because we are actually, we're looking at some of the more particularly bright stars that surround us, things that uh, are a bit stand out when compared with the rest of what's around us. It's, it's something that uh, these are not the average stars, as it were. These are stars that are a little bit special uh, because if you actually consider the closest 60-ish stars to us, they're 50 out of the 60 are what are known as M dwarf stars. They're sort of the dimmest uh, stars out there. And out of those 50 stars, uh, we can see none of them with the naked eye. So 50 mm -hmm. out of the 60 closest stars to us, we can't even see ourselves. And so we have this bias of seeing the brighter things, the things that, that stand out just a little bit more than a lot of other things. And so we actually, uh, we do see and personify the exceptional in the cosmos. We're, we're seeing the biggest and the brightest. And Vega and Altair, they're, they're in the top 20, both of them, with the brightest stars that we can see uh, with the naked eye, even if they aren't necessarily the closest. So we do definitely, when we make stories about the stars, we use things that are a, a bit larger than life, even from a un universe standpoint. We're seeing some of the exceptional things that are out there. And speaking of exceptional things, I, I think my favorite thing in in the sky has to be a nebula. And we were, we're, if we could get a shot of the Dumbbell Nebula, uh, I would like to talk about that. First of all, where the hell did it get its name, and who's responsible? <laughs> who's responsible for this? But look how beautiful it is. And, and, and see, it's like it's like a dumbbell. If if you were uh, you know hundreds of light years across and you wanted to get some exercise in, what what would you lift besides the dumbbell nebula? Uh, <laughs> it's it's a little ridiculous because we we call it the dumbbell nebula. We call it the apple core nebula. It's this gorgeous thing, and uh, it's actually the first planetary nebula people actually uh, Charles Messier discovered in 1764. A Messier M objects being the way why we say like M number or something. Uh, but this, the name of this goes back to Herschel, uh, another guy with a telescope. And so in his notes 
what he said was this was a nebula that was shaped like a dumbbell. And so the astronomy community is a little small, right? And so mm. everybody was like, well, okay, that makes sense. Let's, let, let's just keep it that way. And so the, the names of these objects, the Dumbbell Nebula, the Applecorn Nebula, it sort of reminds me of, you know, maybe there's some guy out there looking with a telescope and, and they look and they find an object and they're like, oh, this is sort of reminds me of the expression my Aunt Kathy had when she glared at that turkey in her driveway that one time. And then he tells this story to everybody else and they're like, oh, that makes sense. This is the Aunt Kathy Nebula. It just, it's this sort of, it's it's this, uh, I think, charmingly unscientific way that we classify things alongside the numbers and the official numbers that we give them. It gives some personality to the sky and uh, lets us have some, you know, opinions on the on the people before us. How did you get to Dumbbell Nebula of all things? But yeah, I, I find it humorous myself. Well, I'm just happy to hear it wasn't named after me. Uh, Eric, <laughs> we're about uh, five minutes away from moving on through the Milky Way. But before we do that, can you bring us up to speed for people who are perhaps just tuning in? Uh, how did we begin? Who are we talking about? And where are we going from here? All right, so let's go through it. So first we're talking about Tanabata, and that is at its core, uh, the Applecore Nebula being the story of the two lovers, Orihime, uh, the star Vega, and Hikoboshi, the star Altair, meeting together crossing the Milky Way and meeting for this one special night a year in the night sky. And so what we've been showing here is their journey as they've been going across that sky, where Hikoboshi first landed on a globular cluster, M71, this beautiful globe of stars. And then Orihime at that same time was making her way towards Hikoboshi and arrived at the Ring Nebula, the first planetary nebula of the night. Uh, and it's this beautiful, beautiful object. It's about 2,300 light years away. It's a great start to the journey. Uh, we also, after that, when uh, we got a little ways in, the second object that Hikoboshi arrived at was the Dumbbell Nebula. And uh, we talked a little bit about how weird that name is. And uh, you know, scientists, they put a little personality into what they see. Uh, they, they put humanity into the stars, just like with this particular fable, this particular story. And Orihime at that same time was visiting the globular cluster M56, an old, old cluster that very easily could have been gobbled up by the Milky Way earlier on in its history, something it cannibalized uh, in the past. And so now what we've arrived at is some different objects. Currently, uh, Hikoboshi is at the Veil Nebula, one part of it. We're going to go to multiple parts tonight. And Orihime is at an open cluster of stars, NGC 6791. And we'll, th this is just a little ways into the journey. There's still even more to come. But yes, we've gone a little ways away here tonight. The Milky Way is in the process of being crossed. Okay, so we're looking at the Veil Nebula right now. What kind of a nebula is this, Eric? Uh, so the Veil Nebula, what it is, so we've been looking at a couple planetary nebula here here today. And the planetary nebula, those are ones that are, if a star is, you know, medium-sized, it's not too big, then it's going to puff up in its old age, donate some of its material out to space. But then uh, some other objects, uh, when they get a little bit, if they're a bit bigger, uh, stars that are really, really huge, at the end of their lifespans, they, well, they set off a few fireworks, as it were. They have this huge explosion called a supernova. So the supernova is this, again, it's this gigantic explosion where a huge amount of gas is just thrust out into the universe, very hot, very excited stuff, and it continues to expand. And so when this, this veil nebula that we have in our sights now is something that is the product of that. It's not the explosion itself, but what we now see um, thousands of years uh, in the future after that explosion occurred, because the gas continues to expand, it's energized, so it makes these beautiful colors and patterns, and it actually sort of bulldozes, you know, certain places of our universe. It forms shapes and bubbles. This is, in particular, uh, this Veil Nebula is part of what's known as the Cygnus Loop which is, uh, it's it's huge, uh, it's, it's very, very big. Uh, and and we're looking at the western portion of the Veil Nebula in the Cygnus Loop, also known as the Witch's Broom. So yes, a whole different breed from the nebula that we've seen before. Nebulae are these you know, gla gaseous clouds, but there are different gaseous clouds we can see out there. And this is the more violent of the two we've been talking about today. 
Well, you mentioned uh, the violet explosions out there, the supernovae. I'm, I'm quite frankly kind of worried for Hikoboshi. Is he going to be okay? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, Hikoboshi, I, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, there's some sort of I immortality to the, this uh you know, character we're, we're, we're talking about. So hopefully he's going to be all right. And, and one thing I can say is that since this explosion happened so long ago, uh, scientists are estimating it happened in around 3000 to 6000 BC. Most of the big fireworks are in the past that, and it's more that it's, it's beautiful to see, particularly at a distance. So hopefully Hikoboshi is keeping away from the hotter clouds. It's the same for us human beings here on earth. We can, we can see a lot of, you know, uh, supernovae that occur across the galaxy and beyond, and they don't get close enough to us uh, to harm us. We don't see any sort of harmful nearby explosion happening in, in the near future. So what these are, uh, these supernovae revenants, they're, they're great uh, opportunities to just see uh, part of the spectacular violence of our universe from a close distance. So they are dangerous, but as long as we keep away from them when the bomb's about to go off, we're, we're pretty okay. Oh. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Um, okay, so the lovers are getting closer and closer now, Eric. And, but, but, but before we move along, I want to ask you, because this, this is utterly fascinating what you've done. You've, you've mapped out their journey. How long did this take, and how did you pick out the object that you wanted to see? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it was a bit of juggling the priorities. So we wanted to make a pathway. We wanted to make a... So, Vegas on one side of the Milky Way, and then we have Altair on the other, and then uh, we're going to meet at the beautiful midpoint, Alberio, the, the head of Cygnus, the swan, the, the, the double star, the, the single, the, it looks like a single star, but it's a double star, uh, so our observatory engineer, Paul Cox, uh, thought of that beautiful meeting place, uh, by the way, so shout out to him for that. Uh, so what we were aspiring to do is make it sort of a reasonably reasonable little pathway toward Alberio from each of these stars, but also pointing out objects that are really interesting, really exciting to see in the telescopes. And in particular, uh, across the Milky Way, we have a bit of an easy time with it. The Milky Way, that milky line that we see, uh, that is the plane of our galaxy. So our, our galaxy does have a pancake-like shape to it, but also has this sort of spherical stuff around it as well. Uh, so, But the, in the pancake, that's where a lot of the action happens, where a lot of uh, we're seeing a lot of the more interesting objects. And so since this is a journey across the Milky Way, we have a lot of interesting deep sky objects to choose from. And so looking for things that take us in the right direction are pretty to see. Uh, and uh, we had ample choice to choose from. So you're seeing the results of that right here, right now. Well, here's another one. Here's a cluster, NGC 6802. Uh, what kind of a cluster is this, Eric? So we're looking at Orihime's last stop before getting to Alberio. We're almost there, folks. Uh, Orihime uh, is at an open cluster of stars. So this is about 3,600 light years away from us. And uh, it might look a little red in the image when we get color to it, because this is one where there's a little bit of dust in the way between us and this cluster. And so that, that dust gives it a little bit of a reddish tinge. But yes, we're looking at it, another cluster, uh, particularly an open cluster of stars. So they've reached new targets, Orihime and Hikoboshi. And a moment ago, we saw, here it is, Veil Nebula Part 2. Talk to me about this one. Oh, yeah. And look at that. Just this beautiful just spread of material across the cosmos. So we were looking at the western portion of the Veil Nebula a little bit earlier on. Now we're looking at the eastern portion of that nebula. So this is one where there's a lot of heavily ionized gas. That means it's energized, it's it's electron shot off. It's 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 really exciting. Uh, and this the reason that we're looking at the western portion at one point and the eastern portion at the other is because this object is so incredibly big. This is huge, the supernova remnant. It covers an area of the sky, I think, tens of times larger than the area of the full moon. Uh, so our telescopes, they just can't fit that whole deep sky object into one little space. So we actually, we have to go to different places across the cosmos to see the whole of this nebula. We're not even going to see the whole of it, uh, the whole of the Cygnus loop here tonight. Uh, so this is 
Hikoboshi making its journey across one object that has just a lot to it. And we're seeing different parts of it. This is all from this one supernova that occurred thousands of years in the past and now has spread out its material. It's made these new shapes, these, these incredible formations in the cosmos that we now get to enjoy again from a very safe distance, which I'm very thankful for. So these are explosions, and they're happening all the time out there. And let, let's just pretend that we can, we can travel across uh, the Milky Way and time is not an, an issue. Could these be useful as navigational tools? Well, they could, absolutely. And we actually, uh, uh, astronomers use them that way uh, in some ways uh, right now in the modern day, even though we can't really travel to them at this point. Uh, the, the supernovae, they're part of what's known as our distance ladder in the cosmos, where we look at distant objects and we try to figure out how far away from us that they are. And that's a little bit hard because we can't take a measuring stick uh, to the next star. We can't take a measuring stick to the supernova and just say, oh, okay, that's, that's five inches times 10, 100,000 billion away. And so uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's this really uh, very, very interesting... Uh, possibility. Um, and so what we do is we actually uh, can measure the distance to some of these very, very um, particular supernova. The type 1a supernova is one where it has a very particular brightness to it. And so it actually, um, what happens is that we can see this supernova explode uh, in the cosmos, and then we know how bright it should be. But then from our distance, it looks a little bit dimmer. So we can figure out how bright it appears versus how bright it should look to figure out the actual distance to that object. So this, these uh, supernova that, that explode around us in our galaxy and beyond, they are actually a way for us to determine how far away some galaxies are to us, some spots are to us. So they are map-making tools in the very present day. Oh, and now, Eric, look at the color of the Veil Nebula. Wow. That's, oh, it's just coming. That's, oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, isn't that, that is, gorgeous? The, these objects, because they get excited and at different energies, so we see different colors. Uh, we see light released uh, from them at different wavelengths, and this is just the poetry of the universe in motion right here. Yeah, it's just, just phenomenal. Um, back to an open cluster question for you. I mean, the, you talked about the size of these things. Uh, that leads to a question that we've all pondered, because of the vastness of the universe, could there be life on planetary systems in open clusters? And that's an interesting question. So when we search for these clusters, when we, we look for life uh, possibly in the clusters, one concern we have is that they, they're a little bit crowded, uh, to be honest. They, they have a, a, a lot of stars in them. And so one of the, um, so the, the stellar density around our sun is there's like a 0 0.004 stars per cubic light year. So there's not too many stars around us. Uh, but with uh, open clusters, they can get more like, uh, say, one and a half stars per cubic light year. So there's a really, there's a lot more neighbors around that can gravitationally interact with each other. That's the possibility that it might be more dangerous uh, for sis, uh, planetary systems to form there. It might be more unstable. So scientists were wondering, is will, there, will we find a lot of planets in these systems? And it actually turns out that, yeah, we're actually finding planets there. Uh, so there, they found a few planets in the uh, cluster M67 recently. And so the discoveries of finding planets around these stars has made scientists determine that it's likely that they're going to find about as many star planets per star in clusters as they would for stars outside of clusters. And so that brings in a whole other exciting potential of what we could find if we try to look for life uh, in these clusters. Would we find life that's different from us? Would, we, would life be as common or very rare uh, in these clusters? Would, they, uh, would we find aliens that are used to really fantastic scenery where there's a lot of bright stars surrounding them? What would that mean for environment, for creating food, for creating energy? Uh, there's a whole lot of potential that surrounds all this that I think is really interesting. Uh, but uh, we're, I think, really at the very beginnings of, of learning about all those mysteries. So it's very much a work in progress. But I wouldn't be surprised if we, we found something there. And one other interesting thing is that if there were, a, if there was a lot of life, in these clusters, there would be potentially alien societies really close together. 
that they could have a lot more uh, a lot more of an easier time communicating with each other, getting uh, to and fro from one system to another. Whereas we're more in the in the suburbs, the rural area, where there's a lot few houses along our roads. So it could be interesting to see maybe interstellar alien societies being built in, in clusters. I think there's more of a possibility and potential there. So interesting thoughts to, I think, consider. Uh, well, I'm, I'm one of those people who actually uh, believes that this has to be the case. I mean, there are just too many planets and stars and objects out there for it, uh, for it not, to be, not to be real. For, there has to be life somewhere. Uh, so we're closing in, Eric, on uh, 50 minutes after the hour. Oh, there it is. There it is. It's the moment we've all been waiting for. The lovers have been reunited. There they are, <laughs> Orihime and Hiko Boshi, two this stars in one. <laughs> oh, I'll be here. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, the the beautiful uh, head of the swan with the naked eye. You would just see it as one point of light, but here we have two stars. They're meeting together in the night sky. Uh, hopefully, it's clear where you are. Hopefully, there isn't rain, and so we're really we're, we're seeing that that story, that meeting coming true. It's a it's a nice romantic thought. Is, any rain where you are, Jerry? Uh, I have no idea, uh, but I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think so. I think it cleared up, but uh, I would, you know what? I'd like to take the head headphones off and go outside and check. Yeah, right. In fact, I, I'll uh, do that right now. I'll be right back. Go ahead. Okay, talk. yeah. I, I, can, I can tell you from where I am right now, it is sunny. It is clear. I'm in California. It is incredibly, incredibly hot. So I think this evening, uh, in, from the California time, Orihime and Hikoboshi will have a fine time actually meeting in the sky. Uh, so, yeah, I was just telling people that California, way sunny, way clear. What about you? Yeah, it's clear. It's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely Seems beautiful. Seems like we're having a lucky night. <laughs> hey, uh, Eric, uh, we got to run, but thanks so much for helping us guide these lovers through the cosmos. Couldn't have done it without you. Have a happy Tanabata, my friend. You as well. Tanabata, you could eat Tanoshinde, take the sign. I couldn't have said it better myself. All right, coming up next, it's SLU's telescope guru, Paul Cox, joining us to discuss. How to choose the right SLU telescope to capture whatever it is you're looking for up there. So stay tuned. We've been all over the world chasing solar eclipses to share with you. This time, you're coming with us. Join SLU as we expedition to Stanley, Idaho to celebrate the transcontinental eclipse on August 21st. Sign up today at slu.com. Space is limited. And welcome back. Well, we've used so many of the telescopes that members can control during tonight's presentation. With so many telescopes and so many potential targets, how do you choose which one to use for which objects? Well, here to help us answer that one once again is our friend Paul Cox, SLU astronomer extraordinaire. Paul, first of all, uh, I, I got to be honest with you, I am blown away by the live views that we have had tonight and the mapping that that Eric was able to do was just incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very rare. I've been really pleased about tonight's show because it's very rare that we ever do a show which really showcases what the telescopes are doing every night, you know, at mm -hmm. the fingertips of members. We, we very rarely do a show where we cover things like nebulae, you know, so the lovely planetary nebulae, the, the ring nebula, the, the dumbbell nebula, then those supernova remnants of the veil nebula. We, they never get shown on our shows, but this was showcasing exactly what those telescopes can do. So I, I was watching while you and Eric and you, you were on with Helen, I was actually using the Starshare camera, um, which is what people can use if they're watching at slu.com. And I was snapping my own images from all of the different feeds. So I've actually got a really cool collection of images from tonight's show. 
Well, I know that some people are out there wondering about the telescopes, and it's obvious that they're not all the same, but it's also pretty obvious if you've watched tonight's show that there's a reason they're not all the same. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you, you may have seen that, you know, we were showing things like um, the planetary nebulae or the globular clusters kind of in quite a close up view. This is a close up view of the Canary 4 solar system telescope. So it's showing us Alberio in a really close up tight um, image. But if we went to the Canary 1, the half meter telescope, you can see they look quite small. And that's, Jerry, because the half meter telescope has got a huge field of view. So it's great for things like those veil nebulae or larger objects. And when I say larger objects, it's, it's not their true size, it's their apparent size in the night sky. But the other thing that you need to think about with the different telescopes that SLU members can use is just think of telescopes as light buckets. They're buckets to collect all the photons that are streaming in from these distant celestial objects. The bigger bucket you have, the more photons, the more light you can collect. And that's why we use things like the Canary One half meter telescope for faint objects like those veil nebulae, like galaxies and other uh, faint nebulae. But we use the smaller telescopes like the Canary Four solar system telescope and hopefully viewers caught those close up views that we had from that telescope of the ring and dumbbell nebulae. Uh, and they look at their very best when you're zooming right up to them. So the Canary One half meter telescope is huge, has quite a large field of view. The Canary Two telescopes, they also have quite a large field of view, but they're, they're large as well. Uh, and when you saw the ring nebulae in those images, you know, they, it was really quite small in the center of the image. So mm -hmm. you then hop over to the solar telescope, sorry, the solar system telescope, and you get these lovely close up views. And that's the one. That's the telescope that members use to view the planets. So at the moment, we've got Saturn is looking absolutely stunning every night. Jupiter, we saw its great red spot in close up detail last night uh, with its moons orbiting as well. Uh, and of course, uh, at the end of the night at the moment, we can also see the planet Venus and we can see its phase using that Canary 4 solar system telescope. And we can see Uranus and Neptune. So it's an absolute planetary fest. Um, you can use all of the telescopes, you know, for some of the dimmer planets, but it's best to use, you know, that tight view, just like the tight view that we're getting of both of these stars at the moment. So Paul, obviously membership has its privileges. How easy is it for members who are able to control telescopes? How easy is it for them to learn which telescopes to use for which particular object or target they're looking for? Well, the new SLU, we introduced something called the SLU 500. These are the 500 best objects in the night sky. And our very clever engineer, Ed Kalin, uh, has written some new code uh, that, that schedules those missions. So it will automatically choose. So a SLU apprentice member can image any one of those 500 objects. And when you select one, the code, the software, SLU's machine springs into action and will choose automatically the best telescope and the best time when that object is imaged. And of course, we've talked about that before. You want to image an object when it's highest in the sky rather in the the muddy low horizon. So SLU 500 is, is literally as easy as clicking the button to say, join that mission. And you can either then watch the mission live as we've been watching these live image streams tonight in color, um, or uh, if you can't stay up and watch it live, all of those images are automatically saved for you. So you can go to your My Pictures area and see all of your lovely images that you've captured. But, so it's really easy for a SLU apprentice membership, but SLU astronomer members, they can choose from any one of these astronomical catalogs. Eric was talking about the Messier catalog, the NGC catalog, which has over, well over 7,000 objects in it. By the way, uh, SLU member Maynard Pittendre is 20 objects away from having collected all of the NGC objects, an absolutely stunning feat. He's been a member <laughs> right, right from the word go, and he's only got 20 more objects to go. So that is an absolute feat. But anyway, uh, slow astronomer members, you can choose some catalogs, but you can also 
um, select any coordinates in the night sky. And that's what the asteroid and comet hunter members do. So they can set up missions using coordinates in the sky to track comets and asteroids and other objects that kind of move against the background stars. All right, Paul, changing gears now. The transcontinental eclipse happens Ooh, yes. in August, third week of August, August 21st. Uh, the, talk about the plans for our big event in Idaho. How's it going? It's going really, really well. I mean, first of all, uh, we can't uh, talk about an eclipse without talking about the new SLU solar telescope. That's in operation every day. And of course, it's summer at the Canary Islands uh, uh, Observatory, the Institute of Astrophysics there. So the days are long. So we're kind of getting you know, eight to 10 hours of live streaming from the solar telescope every day. But yeah, plans for the transcontinental eclipse. Any member of SLU, SLU members, SLU apprentice members, SLU astronomer members can come and join us in Idaho. We've got a campsite set up. It is going to be a spectacular event. It's going to be the first time, actually, Jerry, that, you know, the SLU members from around the world, this virtual community that I've been a, a part of for 13 years now, we're actually going to meet face to face for the first time. So it's, mm -hmm. we've got a fantastic location. Uh, we've got a long period of totality. That's really the most important part of the eclipse. And we're in a really good weather. We, we picked a really good place for good weather prospects as well. So uh, any SLU member can join us up. Just go to the website, go to the SLU road trips, and you can register and you can bring along uh, several members of your family as well. And they can still register for a place at the campsite? Yes, they can. Um, we are expecting, actually, quite a last-minute rush on this. So I would certainly recommend anybody who is interested uh, to, to register an interest on it soon. We've got quite a good capacity there because it's going to be quite a big event. It's, it's really turning into something quite big. We've got all manner of things there. We've got music. We've got yoga sessions as well as live, live observing sessions as well. Eric and I are going to be doing live observing both through special solar telescopes during the day um, and also nighttime telescopes. We're going to show people how to take photographs of the night sky and even the eclipse themselves. Although we are actually recommending to people, put your cameras away. SLU will photograph it for you, right? But you take in, you know, the full impact of witnessing a total solar eclipse. And uh, it's something to behold, I must say. You know what I think, Paul? What's that? I think this is going to be bigger than Tanabata. Uh, yeah, I, I reckon so. You yeah, notice how notice how I notice how I, I I just pulled it all together at the end like that. See that? Absolutely. What goes around Be comes around. Beautifully segued back into uh, seeing the Thank two you. stars of our show here. Very good, Thank Jerry. You. Thank you very much, Paul. All right, good work as always. We'll see you back for our next live show, my friend. All right. We've got plenty to look forward to over uh, the summer, culminating with our live eclipse coverage, as Paul just mentioned. Be sure to join us on Wednesday, July 12th. That is next Wednesday as we head to New York City to witness Manhattan Hinge. And keep your eyes on the Situation Room for additional show announcements. And after that, on July 23rd, we'll be celebrating the anniversary of the discovery of the Hale-Bopp Comet and enjoy an entire comet-themed show. Well, that wraps up our Tanabata Star Festival show tonight. We hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to delve into our community content on the website, slu.com, for more information about Tanabata and a whole host of other subjects, whether you're into science, art and culture, or the spiritual perspective of astronomy, you'll find it all covered there. We want you to contribute to it. Can't do it without you, folks. Thanks to our guests tonight, SLU astronomers Paul Cox and Eric Edelman, and our human spirit correspondent, Helen Avery. I'm Jerry Monteur. Thanks for stopping by SLU, your interface to outer space. Sayonara. <laughs>